Hey, Scott. Hi, Jake. It's great to see you again. Good to see you as well. I wanted to talk about current events, and so we all knew that 2022 would be a challenge. We didn't know what was in front of us, and obviously there's a, a conflict in Europe that is once again causing some disruptions that we didn't expect. We know supply chains have been stressed for two years mm -hmm. with the onslaught of COVID, and, and Ukraine and the conflict over there is obviously adding pressures to that. One of the things we've talked about you taking a look at is commodity prices. And so the first thing I'd like to ask is what have you seen most immediately affected in the commodities markets based on this conflict? Sure. I want to make sure that we put this in the right context because you know, it's been all over the place in the media. Certainly the price of oil and how that relates to what we pay at the gas pump has been a major story in the press and media since Russia invaded Ukraine. That price escalation and inflation was well underway before that happened. It's just been exacerbated and now you know, made the scapegoat for something else. That being said, I looked just at, at lunchtime before we sat down, it was at $106 a barrel today. We can't expect the price of gas or the price of diesel fuel or anything else that's based on oil production to go down until that does. And I don't see that happening from everything that I see in the near future. And what about outside of oil and gas? Are there other commodities that we've seen maybe more specific to the building trades that are affected? Absolutely. And even though we don't import a lot of finished material directly from either Russia or Ukraine, they are both so rich in natural resources. It's the starting place for a lot of the things that we do buy, especially minerals and precious metals, copper, nickel, raw materials for aluminum, iron ore, but then a whole bunch of other things that are more rare, magnesium and titanium and tungsten and manganese and you know, right. the list goes on and on. And this conflict has both disrupted the production and manufacture and mining just because of the nature of things going on, as well as then the distribution, anything that would come out through the Black Sea and south of Ukraine, that mm -hmm. shipping has all been disrupted. It really is a continuation of just what we've seen and talked about for so long, that inflation being really that basic economic principle of supply and demand, yeah. we still have a lot of demand, and now there's just something new that's got pressure on the supply side. So you talked us through some of the raw materials that go into uh, finished products that ultimately make our way over. But I'd love if you could maybe expand on that a little bit, talk about some specific examples, and then if we can tie that to what's happening from mm -hmm. an escalation or a pricing standpoint on some of the trades that we see, that would be really beneficial. Sure. I've got two examples that come to mind that I think both would be uh, really good answers to that question that we could talk about more. One, we mentioned that that part of the world is very rich in natural resources. And nickel is one of the additives that goes in to the manufacturing process to make stainless steel. About two weeks ago now, the price of nickel had gone up quite a bit from you know, the beginning of the pandemic until the first of this year. So many other materials had gone up. There are conflicting stories. One was that China tried to corner the market on nickel because it is used in some, not just stainless steel, as I mentioned, but batteries and a number of other things. But there was a day a couple of weeks ago that you know, if you look back, nickel was trading at $11,000 before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And it had gone up two and a half, three times, but two weeks ago it shot up to almost $50,000. And they actually stopped trading in certain places around the world from what I heard. It settled back now, this week it's back down to about 35,000, but still that's more than three times what it was when the pandemic started. And in that panic of a couple of weeks ago, there was one of our large jobs from our Indiana office. They're doing a, a big laboratory project. Stainless steel piping was one of the major components in that project. And within two days, they got phone calls and emails from that supplier saying there was a two and a half million dollar impact of what happened based on the nickel market and how that then impacted the stainless steel market. Very interesting. Yeah. So I guess just keeping an eye on those, understanding some of the relationships is really going to be beneficial for us. Yeah. It's providing forewarning or mm -hmm. again, waiting on timing and what the commodity markets are doing might affect our clients. And another one from the very beginning, we've talked about all of the impacts from China, both from the pandemic and the shipping situation with the manufacture and the availability of microchips. Mm -hmm. And just as it seemed like we were about to get over that hump and there were stories that things were going to start to be a little more normal in that world, 
guess where, and depending on which report you read, but guess where between 70 and 90 percent of the world's supply of neon comes from, of which is used in the manufacturing process of those microchips. I would guess either Ukraine or Russia. Ukraine. <laughs> And again, just for that simple fact, I've seen things that say, okay, we thought the microchip thing was going to be solved this year. Maybe not. Yeah. You know, it may be with us for a lot longer. And I know there was a project I had a phone call on last week where the mechanical contractor was talking. They're seeing lead times of up to 14 months on some of the big mechanical equipment that has that complicated technology integrated into it. Wow. So you mentioned China when we were talking about the nickel markets, but they obviously are a world superpower. And what other kind of outcomes do you see if they get more involved or get more bold in some of the things they might do? I think that's really become the $64 question of the day, because like you said, being the world's second largest economy, things that they do have a big and wide ranging impact, how they deal with Russia in the future how they deal with the U.S. in the future. How does that all play itself out? Do we figure out a way to play nicely together or is it more adversarial? Mm -hmm. I think the more adversarial it becomes, the higher prices will go, whether that is because of things like tariffs or you know, sanctions or embargoes or all of the different things that we've seen out there. And fortunately here in the U.S., we're at the point now breathing a sigh of relief that we're moved beyond COVID in most places. China still hasn't. Just yesterday, China shut down the city of Shanghai. Yeah, which will obviously have ripple effects in yeah. the supply chain. Yeah, 25 million people between now and a minimum of the 1st of April because they've got this zero COVID policy. But what impact is that going to have of shutting down Shanghai for a week? or two. It's certainly going to impact, again, the supply side and the transportation side. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if we then start to see stories of the number of ships coming back and forth between, you know, China and the West Coast slow down again. So I think those are probably the key things I can think of. I think, you know, once we understand what China will do or how our relationship with them settles out as we move forward, will play a big role in everything. So switching gears a little bit, uh, just going over to the Fed and their monetary policy, we saw them increase interest rates by a quarter point and they've planned on another six more. Some are thinking that it might be seven, Jerome Powell, Powell and some of his comments on that are very hawkish and in controlling inflation, we'll see uh, what happens. But how do you see the war affecting some of the Fed's decisions or in general, just the Fed's decisions affecting our industry? I don't know if the war between Russia and Ukraine is really going to impact the Fed that much. I think they finally got to the point where they started to raise interest rates. Many people have been critical that they waited too long and let inflation be too much out of control before they really acted. So now that they have that quarter point that you mentioned, for the most part, the markets have acted favorably to that in the last couple of weeks, which you know is good to see. Although I do think they're they're going to continue to be volatile from everything that I read. And even when you look at it, whether it's six more or seven more, even if it's seven plus the one that they just did, that's 2%. That's still not a huge number in what makes the financial markets tick. It's not back you know, in the 70s and 80s when there was 10, 12, 14, 16% interest rates. Now we're looking at maybe four or five. I don't think that's going to have a huge impact on our business um, and our industry because the, the demand that we talk about is still there. We're seeing in many markets, healthcare, our industrial work, interiors are coming back strong in the city, entertainment and uh, hospitality and things like that that you know, really did slow down during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. We're seeing many new projects in those markets coming back to life. And so I think when you see in the news and hear stories about, is there going to be a slowdown? Is there going to be a recession? Everything that I have read through the weekend says the recession doesn't appear to be likely. Mm -hmm. And the slowdown appears that it will be most impactful you know, in consumer spending. The reason why Amazon and everybody is, is building all of those distribution centers is because when the government, not just here in this country, but around the world, pumps so much money into the economy when people were home during the pandemic, personal spending skyrocketed. The money supply skyrocketed. Those are the things that drove so much 
and I've read a number of things that say that part of the economy is likely to slow down. Uh, I don't see that impacting our world much, at least today. So one of our goals in having these conversations is to provide advice and guidance to our clients and partners in the industry. I'm curious if, given the recent situation in Ukraine, if any of that advice has changed. I think the short answer to that question from my perspective is no. Even though you know, we never could have foreseen something like that happening and the ripple effect that it's going to continue to have on pricing in the supply chain, I think it just continues to exacerbate the same situation that we've been working through these last two years. And that is for our clients, prices aren't going to come down drastically in the future. So waiting longer to start a project is only going to cost more. And the supply chain things that we continue to see, a lot of them aren't going to resolve themselves as quickly as we thought. So again, the longer you wait, the longer it's going to take to build. So those two key strategies of you know, going quickly and being smart about how we procure the materials, I think are sound and still the strategies that we need to talk to our clients about. Great. Scott, I want to thank you for talking with me today. Obviously, it's a tragic situation. Our hearts go out to the millions of people that have had to flee, millions of people that have stayed to fight. We all hope and pray that there's a positive way forward for everybody involved. But with your forward thinking analysis, this tragic situation has affected our business, is affecting our clients. And I just want to thank you for your forward looking analysis and being our in-house expert on all things pricing, supply chain, and everything else that might happen. It's been my pleasure and we'll continue to monitor everything. And of course, we'll get back together whenever we need to. Thanks.